the best Vice President America's ever had, Mr. Joe Biden. This also gives the internet one last chance to <laughs> talk about our bromance. <laughs> this has been quite a ride. Uh, it was eight and a half years ago that I chose Joe to be my vice president. There has not been a single moment since that time that I've doubted the wisdom of that decision. He was the best possible choice, not just for me, but for the American people. This is an extraordinary man with an extraordinary career in public service. Domestically, he championed landmark legislation to make our communities safer, to protect our women from violence. Internationally, his wisdom and capacity to build relationships has shaped our nation's response to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, to counterterrorism. Iraq, Afghanistan, and for the past eight years, he could not have been a more devoted or effective partner in the progress that we've made. He fought to make college more affordable and revitalize American manufacturing as the head of our middle class task force. He suited up for our cancer moonshot, giving hope to millions of Americans touched by this disease. He led our efforts to combat gun violence and he rooted out any possible uh, misappropriations that might have occurred. And as a consequence, the Recovery Act worked as well as just about any large-scale uh, stimulus project has ever worked in this country. He visited college after college and made friends with Lady Gaga <laughs> for our It's On Us campaign against campus sexual assault. And when the Pope visited, Joe was even kind enough to let me talk to the Holiness <laughs> as well. <laughs> Behind the scenes, Joe's candid, honest counsel has made me a better president and a better commander-in-chief. From the Situation Room to our weekly lunches to our huddles after everybody else is cleared out of the room, he's been unafraid to give it to me straight. Even if we disagree. In fact, especially when we disagree. And all of this makes him, I believe, the finest vice president we have ever seen. And I also think he has been a lion of American history. The best part is he's nowhere close to finish. In the years ahead, as a citizen, he will continue to build on that legacy internationally and domestically. He's got a, a voice of vision and reason and optimism and love for people, and we're going to need that, uh, that spirit and that vision uh, as we continue to try to make our world safer and to make sure that everybody's got a fair shot in this country. So all told, that's a pretty remarkable legacy, an amazing career in public service. It is, as Joe once said, a big deal. <laughs> But we all know that on its own, his work, this list of accomplishments, the amazing resume, does not capture the full measure of Joe Biden. I have not mentioned Amtrak yet or aviators, <laughs> literally. Folks don't just feel like they know Joe, the politician. They feel like they know the person. What makes him laugh, what he believes, what he cares about, where he came from. Pretty much every time he speaks, he treats us to some wisdom from the nuns who taught him in grade school <laughs> or an old Senate colleague. But of course, most frequently cited Catherine and Joseph Sr. 
his mom and dad. No one's better than you, but you're better than nobody. <laughs> Bravery resides in every heart, and yours is fierce and clear. And when you get knocked down, Joey, get up. Get up. Get up. That's where he got those broad shoulders. That's where he got that Biden heart. And through his life, through trial after trial, he has never once forgotten the values and the moral fiber that made him who he is. When Joe talks to auto workers who, whose livelihoods he helped save, we hear the son of a man who once knew the pain of having to tell his kids that he had lost his job. When Joe talks about hope and opportunity for our children, we hear the father who rode the rails home every night so he could be there to tuck his kids into bed. When Joe sticks up for the little guy, we hear the young boy who used to stand in front of the mirror reciting Yates or Emerson, studying the muscles in his face, determined to vanquish a debilitating stutter. When Joe talks to Gold Star families, who've lost a hero. We hear a kindred spirit, another father of an American veteran, somebody whose faith has been tested and who has been forced to wander through the darkness himself and who knows who to lean on to find the light. So that's Joe Biden, a resilient and loyal and humble servant and a patriot, but most of all, a family man. Starts with Jill, captain of the vice squad, <laughs> the only the second lady in our history to keep her regular day job. Jill says, teaching isn't what she does, it's who she is. A few days after Joe and I were inaugurated in 2009, she was back in the classroom teaching. That's why when our administration worked to strengthen community colleges, we looked to Jill to lead the way. She's also traveled the world to boost education and empowerment for women. And as a Blue Star mom, her work with Michelle to honor our military families will go down in history as one of the most lasting and powerful efforts of this administration. She's quick with a laugh or a practical joke, <laughs> disguising herself as a server at a party she once hosted <laughs> to liven the mood. Uh, she once hid in the overhead compartment of Air Force Two to scare the senior staff. <laughs> because why not? She seems to have a sixth sense of when to send a note of encouragement to a friend or a staffer a simple thank you or a box of macaroons. She is one of the best, most genuine people that I've met, not just in politics, but my entire life. She is grounded and caring and generous and funny, and that's why Joe is proud to introduce himself as Jill Biden's husband. <laughs> Away from the camera, Jill and Michelle have each other's backs just as much as when they're out championing our troops. Our girls are close, best friends at school, inviting each other for vacations and sleepovers. Even though our terms are nearly over, one of the greatest gifts of these past eight years is that we're forever bonded as a family. But of course, I know that the Obamas are not the only ones who feel like they're part of the Biden clan, because Joe's heart has radiated around this room. Uh, you see it in the enduring friendships he's forged with folks of every stripe and background up on Capitol Hill. You see it in the way that his eyes light up when he finds somebody in a rope line from Scranton, <laughs> or just the tiniest towns in Delaware. You see it in the incredible loyalty of his staff, uh, the team who knows that family always comes before work because Joe tells them so every day, the team that reflects their boss's humble service here in this building where there have been no turf wars between our staffs because uh, everybody here has understood that we were all on the same mission and shared the same values. There's just been cooperation and camaraderie, and that is rare. 
It's a testament to Joe and the tone that he set. And finally, you see Joe's heart in the way he consoles families, dealing with cancer backstage after an event, when he meets kids fighting through a stutter of their own. He gives them his private phone number and keeps in touch with them long after. To know Joe Biden is to know that love without pretense, service without self-regard, and to live life fully. As one of his longtime colleagues in the Senate, who happened to be a Republican, once said, if you can't admire Joe Biden as a person, you've got a problem. For your faith in your fellow Americans, for your love of country, and for your lifetime of service that will endure through the generations, uh, I'd like to ask the military aide to join us on stage. For the final time as president, I am pleased to award our nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. First and only time in my presidency, I will bestow this medal with an additional level of veneration, an honor my three most recent successors reserved for only three others, Pope John Paul II, President Ronald Reagan, and General Colin Powell. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to award the Presidential Medal of Freedom with distinction to my brother, Joseph Robinette Biden, Jr. Uh, will the aide please read the citation? Vice President Joseph R. Biden, Jr. In a career of public service spanning nearly half a century, Vice President Joseph R. Biden, Jr. has left his mark on almost every part of our nation, fighting for a stronger middle class, a fairer judicial system, and a smarter foreign policy, providing unyielding support for our troops, combating crime and violence against women, leading our quest to cure cancer, and safeguarding the landmark American Recovery and Reinvestment Act from corruption. With his charm, candor, unabashed optimism, and deep and abiding patriotism, Joe Biden has garnered the respect and esteem of colleagues of both parties and the friendship of people across the nation and around the world. While summoning the strength, faith, and grace to overcome great personal tragedy, this son of Scranton, Claymont, and Wilmington has become one of the most consequential vice presidents in American history, an accolade that nonetheless rests firmly behind his legacy as husband, father, and grandfather. A grateful nation thanks Vice President Joseph R. Biden, Jr. for his lifetime of service on behalf of the United States of America. Thank 
please. Thank you. Rachetti, you're fired. <laughs> the press, Rochette is my chief of staff. <laughs> I had, uh, I had no inkling. I thought we were coming over, Michelle, to, for you, Jill, and, and Brock and I to, a couple of senior staff to, to toast one another um, and uh, say what a, what an incredible journey it's been. Mr. President, uh, you got right uh, the part about my uh, leaning on Jill, but I've also leaned on you um, and a lot of people in this room. I look around the room and I see great friends like, uh, like Ted Kaufman, who's been so much wisdom. I was like Mel Monzak. I mean, I look around here and I'm startled. I keep seeing people that don't expect. Madam President, how are you? Mr. President, look at my new boss over there. Uh, it's really, um, <clears throat> but you know, uh, I get a lot of credit I don't deserve to state the obvious. Um, and um, because I've always had somebody to lean on. Um, from back that time in 1972, when the accident happened, I leaned on, uh, and I mean this in a literal sense, Chris knows this, Dodd knows this, and Mel knows this, and Ted knows this. I leaned on my son's bow and hunter. Um, and I continue to lean on Hunter, who continues to, uh, in a bizarre kind of way, raise me. I mean, I've leaned on them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Mr. President, you observed early on that uh, when either one of my boys would walk in the room, they'd walk up and say, Dad, what can I get you? Dad, what do you need? Um, and then Jill came along and uh, she saved our life. She, uh, no man deserves one great love, let alone two. And, um, but everybody knows here I am Jill's husband. Everybody knows that uh, I love her more than she loves me, <laughs> uh, with good reason. And she gave me the most precious gift, the love of my life, the life of my love, my daughter Ashley. And I continued to lean on the family. President, you kidded me once. Uh, um, you heard that uh, in the preparation for the two debates, uh, vice presidential debates that I had, only had two, um, that Bo and Hunt would be the last people in the room and Bo would say, look at me, Dad. Look at me. Remember. Remember home base. Remember. So, and the Secret Service can tell you, Mr. President, that uh, Bo and Hunt and Ashley continue to have to corral me. We are in one of the national parks and I was climbing up on top of a bridge to jump off the bridge with a bunch of young kids, and I hear my son yelling, Dad, get down, <laughs> now. And I just started laughing so hard I couldn't stop. And I said, I was just going to do a flip off, full gainer off here. I said, Dad, the Secret Service doesn't want you up there, Dad. Look at me, Dad. <laughs> you know, so we've never figured out who the father is in this family. <laughs> and, um, Mr. President, uh, uh, you know that, uh, with good reason, um, there is no power in the Vice Presidency. Matter of fact, I just did for Nancy Pelosi's daughters who have readings of the Constitution, and you probably did one for her. And they had me read the provisions relating to the Vice Presidency in the Constitution. And there is no inherent power, nor should there be. But Mr. President, you have, uh, you have more than kept uh, your commitment to me uh, uh, by saying that you wanted me to, uh, to help govern. 
president's line often. Other people don't hear it that often. But when someone say, can you get Joe to do such and such, he says, I don't do his schedule. He doesn't do mine. Every single thing you've asked me to do, Mr. President, um, you have uh, trusted me to do. Um, and that is a, uh, that's a remarkable thing. Uh, I don't think, according to, uh, I see the President of Georgetown here as well, I don't think according to the presidential and vice presidential scholars, that kind of uh, relationship has existed. I mean, for real. It's all you, Mr. President. It's all you. The reason why when you send me around the world, Nothing gets, as my mom would say, gets missed between the cup and the lip is because they know when I speak, I speak for you. And it's been easy, Mr. President, because uh, we uh, not only have the same uh, political philosophy and ideology, um, I tell everybody, and I've told them from the beginning, and I'm not saying this to be reciprocate, I've never known a president, and few people I've ever met, my whole life, I can count on less than one hand, who've had the integrity and the decency and the sense of uh, other people's uh, needs <coughs> like you do. I know you're upset when I told the story about when Hunt and I were worried that uh, Bo would have to uh, that he would, as a matter of honor, decide he had to step down as attorney general while he was fighting his battle because he had aphasia. He was losing his ability to speak, and he didn't want to ever be in a position where, to him, everything was about duty and honor. And I said, uh, and he may resign. I don't know. I just have a feeling he may. And Hunt and I had talked about this. And I said, he doesn't have any other income, but we're all right because Hunt's there and I can sell the house. We're having a private lunch like we do once a week. And this man got up, came over, grabbed me by the shoulders, looked me in the eye and said, don't you sell that house. You love that house. I said, it's no big deal, Mr. President. He said, I'll give you the money. We'll give you the money. Promise me. Promise me. You won't sell that house. I remember when Ashley, Mr. President, we were in the Oval, and Ashley was in an elevator. And the elevator plummeted to the, she was with a group of people, I don't know, just, I forget which building in Philadelphia, and it plummeted to the ground. And immediately the service was worried that, you know, she may have been badly hurt. And I got up to take the call, and you didn't let up until you made sure your service followed through and made sure everything was all right. But you know, Mr. President, um, you know, we kid about uh, both about marrying up. We both did that kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is, I said this to Michelle last night. Michelle is the finest first lady, in my view, that has ever served in the office. There's been other great first ladies, but I really genuinely mean it. When I got to when I got to meet Michelle's brother, um, and he told me about how you guys were raised, and I got to know and love your mom. If your mom were your mom 15 years older, she could have been my mom. I mean, literally. The way you were raised, the way we were raised, there wasn't any difference. And, um, and I knew that this decision to join you, which was the greatest honor of my life, um, was the right decision on the night we had to go and accept the nomination, the formal, um, be nominated at the convention. And Finnegan, who's now 18 years old, was then 10 years old. And she came to me and she said, Pop, is it okay if the room that, that we're in, Finnegan, Maisie, and Naomi, that we have the beds taken out? And I said, why? He said, maybe 
the Obama girls and your brother's children, maybe they would come down and all sleep together in sleeping bags. <laughs> and I give you my word as a Biden. I knew when I left to go over to the convention, open that door and saw them cuddle together, <laughs> I knew this was the right decision. I knew it was the right decision. I really did. Because, Mr. President, uh, the same value set the same value set. Folks, uh, you know, I joke with my staff that I don't know why they pay them anything, because they get to advise me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain what I mean by that. As the president of the University of Delaware, where my heart resides in my home campus of Delaware, as he can tell you, um, it's uh, — I get to give you advice. I get to be the last guy in the room and give you advice on the most difficult decisions anyone has to make in the whole world. But I get to walk out, and you make it all by yourself. All by yourself. Harry Truman was right about the buck stopping at the desk. And I've never, 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 never once doubt it on these life and death decisions. I never once doubted that your judgment was flawed. Not once. Not once. And we've disagreed and we've argued and we've raised our voices to one another, which we made a deal. We'd be completely open like brothers with one another. But, Mr. President, um, I've watched you under intense fire. I will venture to say that no president in history has had as many novel crises land on his desk in all of history. The Civil War was worse. The World War II was worse. World War I. But, Mr. President, almost every one of the crises you faced was a case of first instance. A case of first instance. I watched that prodigious mind and that heart as big as your head. I've watched you. I've watched how you've acted. When you see a woman or man under intense pressure, you get a measure, and you know that, Michelle, and your daughters know it as well. This is a remarkable man. And uh, I just hope that the asterisk in history that is attached to my name when they talk about this presidency is that I can say I was part of part of the journey of a remarkable man who did remarkable things for this country. You know, I can't let a comment go by without quoting an Irish poet. <laughs> Jill and I talk about why you were able to develop the way you developed and with the heart you have. Michelle and I have talked about it. I've confided in Michelle. I've gone to her for advice. I've, we've talked about this man. You give me insight. And uh, I think it's because, Mr. President, you gave me credit for having understanding other people's misery and suffering. Mr. President, um, there's not one single solitary ounce of entitlement in you or Michelle or your beautiful daughters. You girls are incredible. You really are. That's not, a, that's not hyperbole. You really are. Not one ounce of entitlement. 
And Seamus Haney, one of those poems said, <laughs> when, you, when, you can, when you can find someone who says it better, use it. He said, you carried your own burden, and very soon, your symptoms of creeping privilege disappeared. You carried your own burdens, and very soon, the creeping symptoms of privilege disappeared. Mr. President, you have uh, sometimes been like a lone wolf, wolf, but you carried yourself in a way that is pretty remarkable. The history of the journey, your journey, is something people are going to write about in a long time. And I'm not being solicitous when I say this. And you're so fortunate, both of you, to have found each other. Because all that grounding, all that that you had, made this guy totally whole. And um, it's pretty amazing. Mr. President, uh, um, this honor is, uh, is not only well beyond what I deserve, but it's a reflection of the extent and generosity of your spirit. I don't deserve this, but I know it came from the President's heart. There's a Talmudic saying that says, what comes from the heart enters the heart. Mr. President, you have creeped into our heart, you and your whole family, including mom, and you occupy it. It's an amazing thing that happened. I knew how smart you were. I knew how honorable you were. I knew how decent you were from the couple years we worked in the Senate. And I knew what you were capable of. But I never fully expected that you'd occupy the Biden's heart from Hunter, Ashley, my sister, all of us. All of us. And, uh, Mr. President, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm indebted to you. I'm indebted to your friendship. I'm indebted to your family. And, uh, as, uh, I'll tell you, I'll end on a humorous note. We're having lunch, our lunches, and Mostly, and it's, it's what's ever in either one of our minds. We talk about family an awful lot. And about six months in, the president looked at me and said, you know, Joe, you know what surprised me? How we've become such good friends. <laughs> and I said, surprised you? <laughs> but that is candid Obama. <laughs> and it's real. And Mr. President, you know, as long as there's a breath in me, I'll be there for you. My whole family will be, and I know, I know it is uh, reciprocal. I uh, and I want to thank you all so very, very, very much, all of you for being here.